the initial attraction is smoke and fire. It's something very primal and primitive that's deep within all of us. It's the emulation of nature which has really attracted the ancient craftsmen. And this is a tradition that survives very well to this day. This is the Pompeii cut. That's really the founding influence for a lot of the work that you see here. It's an engraved cut that was made in Pompeii before Vesuvius erupted in about 81 AD. To me, this is a perfect object, scale-wise, everything about it. And that's the mysterious link that I think protects this studio and motivates the studio. It's just beautiful and communicates perfectly. We do two different activities here. We carve, and that's typically done with a sandblaster, and we do the more traditional glass engraving using a copper wheel, or in our case, diamond impregnated, sintered wheels. One of the main reasons that I have a career using this technique of incorporating electroformed metal with glass is the fact that glass is one of the world's best insulators. In other words, it won't conduct electricity. We're at the Rhode Island School of Design, jewelry and metal smithing department. This is the electroforming room. I started teaching the electroforming process in 1981. Electroforming is associated with electroplating, which is typically the putting one metal, usually a precious metal, over a base metal. Electroforming is putting metal, usually thicker, over a non-metallic model, such as wax or plaster. You can electroform anything. You have to engineer pieces to withstand the treatment. People have asked me if I use computers, yes. Strangely enough, I like doing it by hand. It's a sandblast, stencil resist, commercial product made for the monument industry. Much of the activity is in pairing an object with its base plate. In my mind, I see the base plate as a segment of a larger, much larger reality. If it works well with the object uncarved, that's the beginning. I paint the entire object with the stencil on with electrically conductive paint, then remove the stencil and the conductive paint is in the carved area. And because glass is an insulator, it doesn't conduct electricity, and you get a really nice differentiation between the glass surface and the metal surface. I will bring things to New York once every six to eight months. I was approached by Barry Friedman in New York. That's the gallery that I work with and show with, and he's a remarkable dealer and a very close personal friend. Well, we call this a, a zigzag cut. It's a novel creation of Mr. Miles Bear. Miles is a third generation Mason, and there's just something in the Masonic bloodline that makes him exceptionally good with his hands. Carving it in the sand, blasting, to cutting, polishing. Pretty much Miles can do it all. Adrian Evans is my assistant who's in charge of molding and wax work. Adrian's dad is a candle maker and so she grew up with hot wax and has a gift. I've always been attracted to casting metal. My goal is to create an object 
a new object, something that hasn't been seen before and of exquisite quality. That's what motivates me is to continually try to refine it and to improve it. My dad was a businessman, so I thought that's what I should be. This was the early 70s. University of Denver in Colorado. The dean called me in and held my registration card and told me I had to cut my hair and shave off my beard. And so I walked out and joined the art department. While I was there, I encountered hot glass. That was my initial contact with smoke and fire. And so I investigated the best places to learn. Decided to come to Rhode Island School of Design, study with Dale Shahuli. That was 1974, and then went to Pilchuck Glass School, Dale School, on the west coast, north of Seattle. That's where I learned about a sandblaster for the first time. And they informed me of the Swedish tradition of a heavy wall, massive vessel, as opposed to the Venetian tradition of paper thin. And since I carved deeply, a thick wall is a very good thing for me. And I shared a bathroom with Jan Eric Rietzman, who was the first European master to come to a, an American glass school. I would say he's one of the top 10 glass workers in the world. In 1987, I took an opportunity to go to Sweden and work with Jan Eric for the first time. And I've been doing that regularly uh, since then. And so when I'm in Sweden, I have to change my working mode and become much more European as a designer. So when I'm there, I'm just working on form and color. This is my notebook. So shape and interior color and moods are recorded in the book. All of these are blown. Beautiful form, Scandinavian form. Most recently, I've been working with metallic inclusions. Because they're made in Scandinavia, I use Scandinavian techniques, the thick wall, the applied foot, which is called a clack. The historical reference is really important. I guess people would say it's labor intensive, but it isn't really for me. It's more like, I mean, I usually have a really good time doing this. Control is at the heart of, I think, all artists and practitioners in glass trying to bend it to their will. I, and I think it's a very difficult material to master. And I, I consider myself to be very lucky in the fact that I chose this material because it will take several lifetimes to master the material. So I never really get bored, ever. Perfect.